We are so fortunate to have these amazingly talented directors all be with us today. Right here there, Marty. Um, this morning I was looking at some images by uh, William Blake, and he said that imagination is not a state, it is the essence of human existence itself. And you five are inspiring sculptors of imagination. And to pick a line from your movies, all of you show us and see worlds beyond what we really live in. And we thank you for your creativity. It's just amazing. <laughs> and now to, to get serious into process, because you know this is an audience of directors and directorial teams, so we want to know how you do it. So let's start with a really important question. What shoes do you wear <laughs> when you're on set? This actually relates stronger to your movie, because it's really in your movie. And where do you stand and where do you sit um, when you're on your sets? Chris, let's start with you. What shoes um, do you wear? I mostly Echo shoes, but I've recently discovered Bluntstones that are the ubiquitous crew boot, and they're very good. So <laughs> I think I'll be switching to the Bluntstones. Um, I like to be right by the camera watching the performance from the camera. So I, um, we don't have a video village or anything. I, I have a little um, UHF monitor that I hang around my neck so I could just check framings uh, or use the camera top monitor. But um, I just try and watch to eye. Um, that's my. Spot. And let's be fair here. Let's introduce you all. This is Christopher Nolan for yeah, Oppenheimer. I am Christopher Nolan, yes. And next to me is Yorgos Latimos for Poor Things. And Alexander Payne for Holdovers. And Greta Gerwig for Barbie. And Martin Scorsese for Killers of the Flower Moon. You know, in a way, your films are so wonderful, it's like, why talk about them? But just keep seeing them. But let's talk a little bit more about it. Yorgos, what do you use Damn for it. shoes? I we're, we're what off. do you use for shoes? And, and where do you stand or where do you sit? Uh, I, I wear hawkers because uh, I have a broken sesamoid, if you know what that is. So I can't wear anything else. Uh, only when it's a nice event like this, I wear my nice shoes. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, I, I also like only have a, a small monitor and I try to be close to the camera and close to the actors, but I also try and make myself small as much as it is possible um, and kind of be out of the way, but like next to them as soon as, you know, uh, we, we finish a take or I need to communicate something with them or to the DP who's operating the camera as well, or sometimes, yeah. Yeah, all around there. Got it. Yeah. Alexander, shoes and where Mer do you stand Merrill's Any and uh, uh, <laughs> similarly, no video village. I'm right next to camera. Got it. Greta, uh, what shoes do you wear? What's your footwear? Um, I, Nike Air Force Ones um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that are usually, I, but during Barbie, they were pink. Um, <laughs> I'm cheesy, um, but, uh, and I like, uh, I, sometimes I'm at the monitor, but most often I'm, I'm, I usually end up underneath the camera looking up. Um, and I sit on a, an Apple box, which um, a couple weeks into the shoot, the grip de and art department made me my mm -hmm. own Apple box with my name yes. on it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm so glad they like me. <laughs> <laughs> Did they paint it pink? They painted it pink and they put a cushion <laughs> on top of it and it said Greta's. I was like, <laughs> Marty, what do you wear? Oh, well, it goes back a long time. On Mean Streets, I was on Fry Boots. <laughs> and um, from Alice Doesn't Live Anymore to Earth Shoes, because I wasn't used to the earth. <laughs> and then from there on in, it's been a, a trying. And uh, finally, I had some shoes made, uh, suede with white stitching, uh, with a nice sole. But after a while, somebody gave me Nokas or Okas or something. Okas. Okas. Yeah, and that you really, I don't feel, I don't feel the, the weight on my knees in a sense. So um, I've been using those actually because um, one of the key things you need to be a director is good legs. 
Seriously, because you're always jumping up. You're always moving around. In you're fact, always, no, are, seriously, your knees. Are you sitting or standing most of the time? Uh, or um, both. Sitting, sitting a lot now, but jumping. <laughs> a great deal of jumping. I don't know if we're going to pick up furious jumping. We'll no, keep no, that going. No, no, uh, no. And, and, and I must say, sometimes really using, utilizing the video as much as possible. In the case of some weather situations, in the case of Killers of the Flower Moon, it was, it, it, we were stuck shooting in a, uh, in a very difficult time there. It's a, it's a great place to shoot, but it was summer in uh, Oklahoma, and it's uh, 105 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And so um, I, I found that I had to be in areas where I could breathe a bit. So, but it was a problem of jumping from the video back into the set, back to the actors hanging around the camera. It let's, was a constant. Let's jump into production design. All five of your films really have very specific worlds that you create. Uh, and, and Marty, in, in particular, I noticed that some of the interiors, like the pool room, the exteriors were always alive and active. Uh, yeah. And can you explain how you set those up with these builds and well, how you made that work? Adam Sumner, the assistant director, co-producer. You know, these things, I say, okay, look, how, how, it's the director's disease, I guess. It's like, come on, it's a two shot with the car in the background, really, let's go. And of course, they have to recreate 1921 <laughs> with horses and, and, and people in costumes. And so I said, let's shoot through the windows. I remember this great shot in Magnificent Ambersons with um, Ann Baxter and uh, Tim Holt walking along the street. And you don't see the street, the camera's angled towards them with the storefronts. And every reflection, which is real, the reflection is the entire town. All the action's off camera, but it's there. And I said, let's do that. I've always wanted to get that kind of thing. In this case, of course, it, um, I love shooting through the windows because so much took place in those storefronts, you know. And were you building these storefronts? And no, the storefronts, the storefronts were there in a place called Pahuska, which is the capital of Osage County. Uh, Steve Ch uh, Chief Standing Bear, uh, that, that's where they, they operate from. And uh, we, we, made, we created it to look like a place called Fairfax, which is more or less the white European town of uh, in a nearby area. Pahuska is the, the main, like the capital. And so um, many of those storefronts were vacant and Jack Fisk uh, uh, just literally, we got photographs of what it was like in 1918, 1910, 1920, 1925, and just recreated. Did you and Jack also build, um, for example, Molly's house and King's house? They yes, feel... those two houses were built. Uh, he chose the land and uh, I, I depended on him greatly because you know I'm a New Yorker. Really? <laughs> and I came on and I said, oh, sky, you know, trees. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, wow, I mean, and, and so I, it, you know, the funny thing is in landscape like that, it's where the frame ends and where the, where the frame begins and ends. Uh, a city, I could, I, I kind of know, it's grid pattern, I have a sense of buildings, but when you have a beautiful tree here and a hill there, <laughs> or this, or that, or this. <laughs> and so uh, I went according to um, what Jack felt was based upon the actual research of what was there, and we built those houses. You make, because you move your camera, like moving the camera, for example, through Molly's house, did, were you already discussing that that's the way I need the interior space so I can go to these five or six rooms with one, with one shot? Or no, no, happen? no, I went the other way. Create the house, and then I'll find the way to find... To, to get through it until we go to the mother's face sitting there. Got it. And one of the things too was the roofs of the, uh, the interior roofs. Oh, the of roofs these were houses. the most beautiful. Yeah. Uh, did was that just through research or where did just that? Just from come? research. Just from and the and some of the houses that exist, those panel those those uh, gabled roofs and uh, um, they they reminded me of uh, you know, German expressionism or the wonderful gable roofs in Night of the Hunter, for example. Um, and uh, but that bright light too. I was not used to that kind of light. In know. terms of the wide shots of the city of Fairfax, um, what is this all created in reality? Is it, or did you yes, go through changes? Yes, we did. We did erase uh, some telephone poles in the background, way in the background, and put a few hills in because since the 1921, um, some buildings or there were other railroad things that have been built, and just to be accurate, you can't really tell. Nobody, if I, had it, if I left it in, you wouldn't know. 
but just to be accurate. One more production design, which is the black and white photographs, particularly in the opening, or not photographs, but video films that we're seeing. Some are, I assume, real, like the airplanes, but did you create most of them? Yes, we created all of them based on 16 millimeter footage that one of the families had um, and they gave us. And um, I have an old camera from 1916 that's hand cranked that was given to me as a gift um, years ago. And um, uh, Rodrigo took the camera, um, adjusted it, and had Ellen Curris direct them while I was shooting something else. And we showed the original, got some people, chose the costume, da, 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 and then literally, uh, you know, did the hand cranking. It, it was a lot of fun. Fabulous. Thank you. Greta, you were creating two worlds, the real world, well, maybe the real world, and obviously an incredible fantasy world. As you were getting inspired by imagery for Barbie Land, mm. what were kinds of the images? And I'm looking specifically something like like the weird Barbie's house, which has a, such a specific design to it. Yes. Uh, well, I always had a concept for um, what uh, Barbie Land uh, would be, which was kind of almost like a uh, like a soundstage musical from. Uh, you know, like sort of the, 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 where you could feel the edges of the stage. Like, I mean, I love, you know, Vincent Minnelli and right. I love, um, you know, Brigadoon or, you know, anything with Gene Kelly, basically. Anywhere where you can feel, I think the, the thing for me was the idea of a painted sky, that it's authentically artificial, that it's there, but what you're looking at is actually a painted, a painted sky that creates the illusion of depth. So, that was that was sort of where we started from in terms of w what I wanted it to feel like. And then because they're toys, it was so important that everything feel tactile. So we did have a lot of stages where we did these big builds, which were unbelievable. And everyone, I mean, like the truly the sky painting was um, made me cry I, because it was there are very few occasions that you need a vast, beautiful painted sky. And um, there's actually a wonderful book about um, matte paintings and mm. and that is sort of it, like it is like these incredible, actually Lemony, Lemony Snicket, they did incredible um, paintings and beautiful uh, kind of interior builds that forced perspective and stuff like that. And so I wanted that feeling. And then we also had a, a very large miniatures department um, to build everything, um, the whole town and everything in miniature. And some of it we would build both miniature and large so we could photograph both ways and that you could kind of create this um, almost a slight catch where you think, I know that's a miniature, but then what? And then how are they in it? That it kind of has this. Uh, you did that with the cul-de-sac a couple times. Yes, we and did it with. You even did that in the opening because I assume our legs are. are, are the, the, the legs, those legs, we actually did build giant Margot legs. Um, <laughs> and I remember the the um, uh, the cons the man who was the construction manager and everything put them. Um, he got he had them in his house and he put them next to his children and sent me pictures and he was like, is that. Was that right? And I was like, what do your kids think you do? No. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but, sure. um, but, but I think, and, and, and the, the miniature department was incredible and they didn't believe me for a very long time that I actually wanted to build miniatures and, they, and we were shooting in England and they say, they always say they want miniatures. And they don't. And I was like, I was like, no, no, no. We really, we want them. We want them. And they were like, they. And then they finally were making them. They were. It was the most beautiful thing. Anytime I'd get sad, I'd go to the miniatures department and look at them paint palm trees because it was just emotional. So talk about weird Barbie. Barbie so weird awesome. Barbie. Yes. Yeah, so we built that. That was both miniature and large scale. Um, so, uh, so the shot where she's walking up to weird Barbies. That's uh, com just a composite. We would always ask ourselves, how would they do it in the 1950s? Like how would you do this if like we'd give ourselves the restrictions of like what would be possible with like more basic optical shots and sort of even like with driving shots like if it would be rear projection then you wouldn't move the camera like you'd want to pick a frame that you could you then use it so yeah she's walking up to weird barbie and that's um it's a composited with a miniature and then once she's inside that's a full build the actual shape of the house oh yes yeah, that too. It's the only shapes that don't have completely perfect right angles. Um, it, uh, we changed the angles, but we had this idea that it was um, everything in Barbie land is, I don't know if this is true. In my mind, 
it was all space trash. Like, meaning, like, if you put, like, a trash out into space, it never disintegrates. I don't know if that's real, but in my mind, that's, that's how it is. Like, the, there wouldn't be actual aging that takes place. It would just be strangely recombined, like a child had done it. And so, um, you know, and that took many, like anything in films, it takes so many meetings to get to the point where you're like, this is the language of what we're doing. But it was weird Barbie and everywhere, it was all these interior worlds. And then it, un, I guess, unlike creating something real, I wanted that heightened feeling. So I wanted everyone on the stage to be dancers. I didn't want, I, I wanted everyone that you would see even when they weren't dancing to be dancers because one of the marvelous things I think about musicals is they have this quality of something surreal because in Oklahoma if you just look at someone in the background they're looking at a hat but it's like their entire body's doing it um, and it's strange but it's like wonderful and I was like well in this language of this movie I'm gonna have every single person doing something totally odd in the background and that's the language of dolls is the language of um, dancers in a in a in a musical. Thank you. Alexander, I assume most of the film is practical locations. But all, ladies, all of it. All of it's practical. Not even a bathroom or a closet, all locations. And the question, <clears throat> one school, many schools? Many, uh, five schools. The, the uh, Barton Academy of the fictional Barton Academy is comprised of five different schools in Massachusetts. And in terms of what what became the exteriors versus sort of the interiors, particularly the large auditoriums, which are very powerful because they're oftentimes empty, where did yeah, that come from? Yeah, well, you know, film has a wonderful capacity to lie. And so uh, I just thought, well, I like this auditorium, and I like this, this exterior, and I like this chapel all at different places, and then, you know, they just all meld together <laughs> in, the, in the film. Now you found some things happened in terms of locations and production design accidentally. I'm told that the bowling alley was not in your script that you were researching and finding. This is close. Yeah, correct. I mean, that's there's a lot of interplay between screenplay and location scouting. So if the screenplay says one thing and we can't find it, or it's going to be too much of a hassle to recreate, then you say, well, I found this location, so let's retool the screenplay. You know, there's a lot of, you know, between casting and screenplay, and production design and screenplay, uh, there's, it's, it's a free flow. So uh, the screenwriter had originally um, written a Winter Carnival, which used to be popular in Boston. I didn't want to recreate a damn Winter Carnival. I, <laughs> it's not, I've never been to one, you know, Boston Winter Carnival, I don't know, for like a half a page of dialogue. But so in location <laughs> scouting, we found this, this candle pin bowling stuff. I said, instead of there, why don't we move it to bowling? Similarly, the screenwriter had had uh, the uh, old fantastic pornographic CD combat zone of Boston. I don't know, I can recreate the damn combat zone. So anyway, it became an outdoor bookstore, which is actually near the combat zone, what was the combat zone in Boston, so we could still play that it was on the periphery of that CD area and an unusual, unsuspected location to be, which is real in Boston, that outdoor uh, bookstore. So stuff like that. Talking about uh, Boston itself, uh, there is a moment when they walk past, I just have to add, there's a moment when they walk past a, a graveyard and there's a woman is feeding a squirrel. It's Thanks for yeah, mentioning that. that. That's the best <laughs> shot in the movie. How about that woman? <laughs> That That's squirrel. the best like that. shot in the movie, Jeremy. Go on, I want to hear. Tell us. So, uh, well, <laughs> I'm honored that you asked. Thanks for the interest. This <clears throat> so you just have two guys walking through a park. So how can you spice it up a little bit? Well, in Boston Commons, there are only squirrels. And even in wintertime. So I had an idea, and I looked amid the pool of extras shivering in the, you know, over here. And I pulled out this lady because I liked her costume. And then I said, uh, who's got nuts? And the dolly grip had nuts in his pocket. He always keeps <laughs> nuts in his pocket. <clears throat> so I gave the lady nuts and I said, okay, as Paul and Dominic walk by, try to you know, toss uh, peanuts to that squirrel. Well, eventually the squirrel came close and it took about 11 takes and finally we got it to eat out of her hand in the shot and that's when I knew we had a movie. <laughs> One more production. I don't think I'm going to top this one, but the Roxbury House. The what? The, the Roxbury House, where, where Mary's uh, uh, yes, sister lives. Right. It's the three stories, all the rest. Was that 
I like that one. We're going to have that. Or was that also sort of? In the uh, it was scripted that she, that that the, the, her relatives live upstairs somehow. So I told the location people, you know, give me some choices of something where you with an exterior stairway that's in the right location suggests the race and class of the people in the screenplay. And we found that place and uh, dressed it. It's a great location. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Since I know all of your, all of it was practical, you didn't build a thing. I, so oh, let's yeah, just continue. Yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah. It's all practical. Uh, can you start with the Very boat? good locations manager here. Really? <laughs> can you start with the boat and talk about the exterior of the boat and also the interior of the boat? Because they both are so striking and obviously the interior plays such a big role in terms of the story. But how did that evolve, particularly starting with looking at the boat and then how do you design the interior? Yeah, so uh, we also used quite a few miniatures, so the, all the wide shots of the boat are miniatures, and then we would composite uh, people on them. Then there was uh, a, quite a large part of it that was built, uh, and uh, we would do like wide shots up to the point, you know, where it, the boat finished and we didn't have more money to <laughs> extend it. and. But we would we had we scanned the miniature that we built, so whatever we had to fill in, it was an actual built thing and painted and you know handmade, so it wasn't like a CGI created thing. And then we used uh, the boat was one of the few times that we used and the miniatures uh, an LED screen, because us likewise we wanted to use whatever old school technique we could you know uh, use, but then. I thought that it would be beneficial to also use technology. So, but even again, the you know the the seas and the skies that are that were in the uh, on the LED screen, it was uh, kind of compiled together by different kind of footage from you know this that the the, um, the clouds were like. Uh, liquids that you know there's this guy Chris Parks in 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 London that shoots these all these liquids uh, so we composited all of these uh, different landscapes and we would play them on the LED screen uh, this the, the shape of that boat is so striking do you remember why and how that happened did someone just bring you a model or had you looked at the <laughs> images or what no I mean we we had a long process of uh, figuring out the world and designing the world, and we looked at references, you know, from period things to very contemporary things, and we were always trying to find something that felt unique to the world that we were creating, and we, we weren't so much cautious about being loyal to the period. Uh, so, the, you know, the boat is a combination of, you know, old... Uh, ocean liners and but with contemporary elements and uh, so yeah it was just like you know feeling free to just you know combine things and make something uh, that felt you know you've designed in this three cities you've got Lisbon you have Paris and you have London as well and and also Alexandria specifically can you talk a little about the Alexandria this is where she sees the people in the poverty. slum yeah. and it's a sort of an amazing there's a first of all that pullback is an amazing shot when you finally go wide but even the very structure of that one of Alexandria yeah. can you talk about how that evolved yeah, that was the most complicated. The the wide shot is a miniature again. So uh, we shot the the miniature and then we composited. We we built a set which was the stairs and the the interior of the restaurant and the veranda around it. And so we composited that part of the set to the miniature so that we could have uh, Emma and Gerard uh, going down the stairs. Uh, and then her POV, the slum, was again another set that we created was mainly the the big hole with the people and the animals and everything there. And then that again we composited into the into the miniature. Uh, and again, like Alexandra is not really Alexandra. It's just like a little island with these you know uh, cable carts that go there, which were actual actually miniatures as well. And then we just 
It was a, the only few times that we shot, I think I avoided that day. We shot Emma and Gerard on a green screen, which I hate. So I think I just let Haley, <laughs> our AD, just do that. Like, just tell them to stand in there and we'll compose it to them there. I can't, you know, look at them against the green screen. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, uh, but you know, the, the rest of it is a miniature. And a similar question that I was asking Martin in terms of design and moving camera, because both in, uh, particularly in Lisbon, there's a lot of motion. She moves through it as well as your camera moving through it. And the design of it, are you seeing the shots that you want? So you're talking to your production designers of this is what I'm going to shoot, or are you talking, let's create this world and I'll find a way to shoot it? Yeah, well, the latter, uh, I, you know, unless you're trying to achieve something very specific, but it, it's mostly the latter. Like we, well, Lisbon was actually a huge set. Uh, that's what they tell me, because when I went in, I was like, she has to wander around here. There's like three streets. How are we going to do this? And everybody was like, whoa, this is the biggest set we've ever seen in our lives. I go like, yeah, but it's like three streets. How are we going to do it? Um, so yeah, we, it was just like, um, yeah, we built the biggest uh, that we could. And then, you know, we figured out the shots and, you know, like Alexander says, you know, lying around corners and stuff and, uh, you know, changing the background and trying and make it look Thank bigger you. than it was. Cool, cool. Thank you. Chris, you built and you also obviously um, found real locations, even some of the real locations from the time, Oppenheimer's house. But there's a very specific location that I'd like you to expand on, which is, in fact, a lot of the movie evolves from it, which is the uh, interrogation scene where he is, uh, whether he's going to get clearance or not. And I gather this is not a build. This is a small space. Can you talk about why yeah. you made that decision, how you worked it? Sure, in so in this whole film that we put together about the atomic bomb, you want to ask about the little porter cabin we shot in, <laughs> which is fine. I always like the different directions you go in, Jeremy, but I, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's an old temporary office that was built uh, in a parking lot of the Braun factory, which is now disused. It's used for a lot of commercials. I'm sure a lot of people here have filmed it. Um, and it, they have some some buildings that were built, you know, sort of temporarily, more or less glorified porter cabins, and they've been there forever, and they're empty and kind of mouldering. And the descriptions of the the real space and the security hearings, and Lewis Strauss, who's played by Robert Downey Jr., his character was very very savvy about how to conduct these hearings, and so he did them. Uh, the mall in Washington, they had had all these temporary buildings built in World War II that stayed there for about another 10 years. And it was very similar to what we found at the Braun factory. And I got Hoyter, Van Hoyter, and my DP, you know, we went there and looked at in the room. It's about seven feet wide. It's very, very small. And I said, well, how do you feel about being in here for a couple of weeks with an IMAX camera with 12 actors? And, you know, is that crazy? And the thing I love about working with Hoyter is, and, you know, he completely got it. I'd convinced Ruth de Jong, a designer, who's a fabulous designer, and she she sort of got it because you have to contrast the the claustrophobia and the sort of out of the limelight quality of those hearings with the Senate confirmation hearings of Louis Strauss, which we shot uh, in New Mexico in a much grander place in a, in a state Senate building. Um, Hoyter sort of loved the challenge and he, he understood my concern, which is it's very difficult to make things look small on camera. It's sort of the opposite problem you're talking about. You build a giant set, it can be very difficult to make it feel you know, really expansive. But when you really want something to feel small, it's actually quite difficult to do that. You know, Most of the spaces architecturally we, we've grown up watching in films are underbuilt. They're much smaller than the real world. And so lenses and cinematic languages evolve to maximize that. So when you actually want it to be small, it's quite difficult. So we really went for the smallest possible room and it meant, you know, we would have a Panavision 70 mil camera in the corner and I'd be jammed in beneath it. And there was no, I mean, there's no room for anybody in there apart from, you know, the boom guy and, and Hoyter behind the camera. And that really, I think, helped the actors. It helped the whole claustrophobia of everything. And we didn't touch the place. We didn't clean up the walls, we didn't do anything. Cause it's just, you know, real life just, just has so much texture, it's very difficult to improve on that or, or recreate that. In creating Los Alamos itself, and mm. particularly in creating the tower, 
because the tower plays obviously such a major role in terms of this entire story. What were you going through? Because you were not just showing it from distance, but we're on it, we're experiencing, we're yeah. close to it. Talk about the evolution and how you shot the tower. You may be up. You know. Yeah, I mean, the, the tower uh, came about, we built it full size. Um, we looked at building it in the real Trinity location, but it's still, a, it's White Sands, New Mexico, still a live fire. Uh, Department of Defense location. So we went, we were able to go there and look at it, but building it there would have been impractical. So Ruth did a, I thought, a very brilliant thing, which is to look at the mountain range and just move, you know, an hour or so up the mountain, it's the same mountain range, and find private land, a private ranch in the same proximity to the mountains, and then built the tower there. Um, it's a rare instance of where disorganization really helped me because we hadn't had a meeting about what scale we were going to build the tower, you know, how we were going to go about it. And I think I hadn't worked with Ruth before. And I think the art department, you know, probably hearing all my bluster about doing things for real over the years, just assumed that I wanted to build it for real. So they had just figured out how to build the thing, you know, its full height um, on their budget. And I was like, great. You know, they got a subcontractor in who could build a, a steel tower like that. The original tower was a, a radio mast that they had repurposed. Um, and so they built it exactly, you know, the way it was. Um, and then very late in the day, um, in a production meeting, I sort of said to everyone, well, how, but how are we going to shoot in the cabin at the top? Because it's 120 feet in the air. Um, how are you even going to climb up there? How are we going to get a camera up there? And it was just one of those things. You have them on every film where no one had really wrestled with that. And they were talking about 80-foot scissor lifts and things or whatever. And I finally, I'm just like, I'm not going up there. So <laughs> what? And I said, okay, just build me a second cabin and we'll put it on the back of a truck and we'll just drive it up on the ridge. There's some low hills nearby. Um, and one of the things, I mean, it's an interesting conversation with the visual effects guys always, but a good thing to know is if your camera is at eye height, the horizon is always at eye height. It doesn't matter if you're a thousand feet in the air, 2000 feet in the air. And a lot of visual effects people <coughs> don't understand that. They'll, you know, when you go up, they'll kind of lower the horizon. That's not how nature works. So if you build on the ground, as long as, you know, we had a clear view to the distant scenery, we could just shoot in camera and it was fine. It matched very well what the view was from, from the tower. Um, so the only person who actually had to climb it other than stunt guys was Killian. So we put him on a wire and you know, made, him, made him go up. But um, it, was, it was really, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a wonderful thing for me to be able to shoot the reality because they, they looked at all the reference and the art department had done an incredible job. And Ruth had found things like, very late in the day she explained to me that when they, when they hoisted the gadget and the tower, um, they put mattresses underneath it in case it fell. And I was like, well, we gotta put that in the film. I mean, it's so representative of how insane the whole proposition was and how, how scrappy, you know, this this operation and, was. And I know that, that in this film, you did not use or did not wanna use uh, any kind of CGI. Yeah. And so therefore, when the explosion happens and there's a series of shots um, yeah. and they're, they, they evolve and they get more intense, what were some of the devices that allowed you to be able to have not just one major explosion, but so many varieties of visuals for that? Well, I, I showed the script. I mean, the first person I ever showed the script to was always Emma, uh, Emma Thomas, my producer and my wife partner who reads it. I then immediately showed it to Andrew Jackson, who's done the visual effects for me on the last couple of films and has a special effects background. So he knows the analog world as well as the CG world. And I showed it to him very early because I said there are going to be very few shots in the film, but I really want to find a way to do them in an analog way. Because to me, computer graphics, though it's incredibly versatile, you know, the things you could do with CG are amazing. They tend, for me as an audience member, to round off to animation. They tend to feel a little safe, a little distance. And he got that. Um, and he really just, uh, first on his own, and then with Scott Fisher, our special effects coordinator, he spent months and months and months just coming up with all kinds of, of different approaches to how they would do this. First, the, the visualizations of the quantum world that, that you get in Oppenheimer's mind, and then their ultimate expression in the Trinity test. And the combination was massive explosions out in the desert with different frame rates, forced perspective itself, with very complex um, 
combinations of you know magnesium flares along with gasoline you know in the right combinations to give the flash at the beginning and then very very small miniature work uh tiny you know things floating in liquids balloons and liquids things like that and then shock waves maybe you know andrew would set up a you know a table of dust and have a wire that he would trigger that would you know shoot towards camera and use this extremely high frame rate so you get this kind of shock wave effect and you combine a lot of these things in camera and then composite a lot of them after the fact in camera and so a lot of them were done in camera a lot of them were done in camera i mean some of the, i would say of the the trinity test itself probably half of those shots are actually just optical blow-ups to imax from 35 mil vista vision um yeah he, he did a remarkable job and the thing that we never really talked about it because I think it would have been too daunting, but it was in the back of my mind as I knew we would have no sound on it. Because the truth is when you do visual effects, to sell visual effects in films, usually the sound is doing an enormous amount of work. And you chose silence. Well, I didn't feel I had a choice really because the reality, you know, you're trying to portray the reality and they had to be five miles away from the, the uh, ignition. And so you have that period of time you have to deal with, which in, in cinematic terms is endless. It was about 25 seconds before the, the sound hit. That choice, was that a choice that was, um, we'll, if we get here to, to editing, was that a choice that you, you preconceived, I know I want these visuals and I know I don't want to hear it? Yeah, I put it in the script. I mean, I tried to write, I tried to imagine how we would do it and, and wound up using uh, a bit of dialogue from earlier in the film where, you know, he famously this line from the Bhagavad Gita went through his head and, you know I'm become death destroyer of worlds it made sense therefore we had this moment of silence to be to give it an intimacy and just hear the sounds of breathing and, and that kind of thing um, but I don't I didn't really have a backup plan I was a little afraid of the whole I, w I was a little afraid of how that was going to work because I'm very used to synchronizing sound effects with picture we'd experimented with it in Dunkirk a lot we tried to respect the reality of the more distant explosion so in that film, we have a series of explosions along the beach and we start out of sync and then they gradually come into sync as it comes closer, things like that. But I, we were sort of out on a limb and, and so much of it really was about the actors and about their response to it. Um, let's, let's go into that subject, which, which is working with your actors. Um, and I'd like to, you all five to talk about rehearsal and I'd like you to re talk about rehearsal in two ways. One is in the way of if you did any rehearsal, and I know some of you did beforehand, and what that process is. And it's so intimate, obviously, because nobody else is really around if you're doing it. So it would really be for us to know what you did if you did pre rehearsals on, you know, before actually shooting. And then also on the day of. What's the rehearsal on the day of? You have something to shoot? How do you rehearse at this particular moment? And Mari, I'm going to turn this over to you, if you will. First of all, was there rehearsal time before you actually started shooting? And if so, what did you all do? <clears throat> well, it was a confusing situation because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> I had at first thought, as um, Eric Roth and I could put a script together uh, in 2017 um, before doing the film The Irishman. But then uh, De Niro and... and um, a number of others uh, pointed out that if we waited a couple of more years for Irishmen, no CGI would help. <laughs> I, got I got it. Last lines so, in Greta's movie. I got it. You know what I mean? We had to go in <laughs> and do it. And the damn CGI, they, they turned out beautifully, I think, but um, it was a whole new world. And uh, uh, in any event, during that process, we were working on the script and working on the script. Um, and then um, uh, at the end, during the uh, post-production of Irishman, we got the script up to a certain point at which um, that and a couple of trips to Oklahoma I made and meeting with the Osage uh, people there, and especially in a place called Gray Horse, which is another district, um, I began to realize that the approach we were taking of the script was the opposite was the opposite of what it should be because when I got to uh, Gray Horse they threw a dinner for us and I hadn't realized and was, they said a few people it was 250 Osage in regalia and a traditional dinner and then people got up and started speaking about into a mic speaking about their grandparents experiences their uncles their aunts 
and I realized that the, um, I would say the catastrophe had a face, and the face was the story was here, particularly Margie Burkhart, um, Ernest Burkhart's, uh, uh, the character DiCaprio plays, his uh, granddaughter pointed out, because you must remember, she said, first people were a little apprehensive because of the kind of films that I'm known for in terms of apparently a lot of violence in them. And, <laughs> It's movies. You know? Yeah, they didn't make only, uh, not every film, but on the other hand, they, they anyway. Um, but she got it up and pointed out she had seen silence and uh, knew that there was something else there. And then she said, you have to remember, um, her grandmother and grandfather, um, they were in love. And that's when it suddenly hit me. I said, I think we're coming at this from the wrong direction. And then COVID hit. And that year, when we were locked off, when we were all locked off. I mean, my wife and I, we couldn't see our daughter. I mean, it was just, I was on a Zoom usually or on phone working on the script. <clears throat> right before COVID hit, Leo had the same impression and said maybe instead of playing, instead of playing uh, uh, Tom White, who was played beautifully by Jesse Plemons in the film, uh, I should play Ernest. And I said, because he asked me, where's the heart of the film? I said, the heart is they were in love. And the heart also, I found out, was that, and this is by way of rehearsal, I'm talking now, um, the heart was also the fact that another uh, Osage gentleman who was a lawyer and was pretty much against making the film, looked at me and said, you don't understand. He said, Bill Hale and Henry Roan, guy he has shot in the back of the head, they were best friends. I'm saying, what's going on here? There's something else besides villain and the hero. None of that doesn't exist. It, what exists is complicity. Um, and um, um, a sense of dehumanization. Um, and so I said, but yet it's all based on love and trust and the betrayal thereof. And when we said, well, yeah, friends could betray you, but a husband and wife having children. So Leo looked at me and said, I think I should play Ernest. And we realized the whole script had to be taken from the center and ripped out and reworked from another angle. Uh, and that happened during COVID, basically. And so by the time we were thrown into production, I hadn't finished it. And so we were finishing it. At, uh, honestly, we were finishing it uh, pretty much as we were shooting. Um, and they were rehearsals. I would call them rehearsals. They were meetings. They were discussions. And a lot of it came from the Osage Nation themselves. Uh, for example, real quick, um, uh, Chris, um, um, uh, a man named Chris, who was teaching because the language is gone. Now, there's only a few people who know a little bit of the language. So he was teaching uh, um, uh, Lily Gladstone how to speak it, and also Ernest uh, Leo DiCaprio's character also spoke Osage because he really liked them. Um, he was teaching them all that, and then he would tell stories, folk tales about a trickster, a coyote in the whirlwind, and she brought that up. Uh, Chris Cote just said this, and I said, and she said, what if what if Leo's the trickster? He's the he's the uh, He's the uh, trickster, and the, he, he's actually a coyote in the whirlwind. She's the whirlwind, and she wins, ultimately. Um, it's uh, very much of a prominent figure, like De Niro was the raccoon. Um, the prominent figures in the folktales, and all these things fed into the shoot. But um, because we had, I felt, control over the uh, location, because the little town itself became like a sound like a uh, back lot. I knew that we could move from one place to the other if we want to rewrite something and shoot another day, you follow? And so the weather didn't matter except for the heat. And nobody could read that on screen anyway. Um, and so, um, and the tornadoes, um, uh, which we were, got, got, we were lucky. But what was happening was that as each day went by, because a lot of what we were learning from the Osage themselves, and we became very friendly with them. And I don't know, we had a good time together. We were just hanging out all the time on set, they were behind the camera, in front of the camera. And so the scripting came from um, myself and rehearsals, were, which actually were readings of, the, uh, readings of the scenes, and then saying, what if we do this? What if we change that? And the key element was ultimately, how much did Ernest know and when did he know it? Was he really, really that delusional to think he wasn't hurting her? And she really, really trusted him to the very end. And she did. In reality, even the FBI guys were saying when she was in the courtroom, she would go every day to the courtroom, the FBI guys would say, she's here again. 
When is she going to realize Love is it? blind. And, yeah, what is that? And then finally, afterwards, she left him. When you, know. you would walk onto the set, let's say, doing a scene, I'm, I'm looking at a long dialogue scene between Lin Lin King and Ernest Mead for the first time. This is a long dialogue Well, that scene. was written uh, many different times, and then I combined it from different scenes. And what would you do, though, if, if that's the scene you're shooting today? What's the rehearsal bar? Do you actually get your actors? Did you get them together and rehearse this scene before I tried the to. crew? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I tried to. Bob had hurt his leg, his knee gave out, and so a lot of the scenes he's in, De Niro, are now seated. Um, but it was fine, he had his leg up, you know, nobody had. And um, I was thinking, do we have to shoot him falling off a horse? I said, no, no it doesn't matter. He's an older man, he sits with, anyway. Um, <laughs> but we, yeah, it was nice. So we combined different versions of the script that I had, uh, of that scene that I had for quite a while, and basically we got together and made sure it was going we all made sure where it was going. Like, no, we took that line and put it here. Oh, no, but what if I do? Literally, that's all it was. And they were seated. There couldn't be too much damage in terms of movement. Now, when you're doing this, and it, it's, it, where's the crew? Is there a, do you have I don't a know, they, they, uh, they were in the house somewhere, but I, <laughs> the thing I have it, I, I don't, I, I have a thing with um, uh, noise. I just don't want anybody around me making any, you know, banging on, and that sort of thing. I just can't do it. Right. I have a bad, it gave me headaches, so. Everybody knows now to be, be respectfully quiet for the actors so the actors could concentrate and that I could even concentrate with Rodrigo and say, you know what, where the hell are we aiming? What about that lamp over there? What about, you know, this sort of thing? And the movement goes from left to right, not right to left. And so they're very respectful Got over it. the years, I get that. In a, but in, they wait, they wait actually. In another one where, um, where he, he's saying the, the argument about, about I'm gonna give her a shot on medicine and you know, he gets very, he attacks her. This is uh, when, he, when he gets- Oh, the, he did that in Osage. Got it. Yeah. So, but my curiosity also is sort of, you're rehearsing that scene before you're shooting it. Uh, and yes, what, yes. What, what is that process? Again, is it similar? That again was everybody out. Right. Two of us, leave us alone for a couple of hours. Leave us alone for a couple of hours, man. Just don't, please. And the minute, we got the angles, we know. We know. And once they get to two or three, maybe four times, we got it. You know. And are we coming in a tighter? Not necessarily. This way, that way. And the fact that it's an Osage, it was a lip, it, you know, it was, I mean, it worked many different ways. For example, becoming so close with the Osage, uh, there was a scene in a roundhouse where there's a, uh, 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 where uh, Yancey uh, Redcorn, who, who plays Chief Bunny Castle, is saying, you know, two, two people have been found dead this week from the ocean, uh, specifically dead, shot, you know, which means that they didn't die of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the weak, 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 weakness, illness, whatever it is. Um, it, you know, they couldn't fudge it, like with bad alcohol or whatever. These people were shot. And so he called everyone together and they're talking. And the set was really nice that, that, that Jack had built based on the real roundhouse. But you know, it was hot. It was real hot. And uh, there was Yancey Redcorn and a um, man named Everett Waller, very big Osage guy and uh, formidable. You know, first when I met him, hi. <laughs> 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 this guy is like, how you doing? And he would look at me. You know, and he was, he had a way of speaking. Uh, he was also a lawyer. Right. And um, so he, didn't yeah, you to make yeah, he was sitting next to Yancey. And at one point, real fast, I got him because we go, uh, I said, I need a reaction shot of some of the Osage that are here to some of the down lines that Yancey's been saying. So I knew Everett could push it a little bit. I said, Everett, would you mind doing some off camera for me? Well, I'm, I'm just gonna go check the angles of the, you know, for the reaction shot. Some people, I keep thinking, uh, you know, widescreen, I want that Eisenstein 133 look, but you can't get it in 235. So <laughs> I run out and I go into the where the video is and it's hot and I'm doing, I'm looking, I'm looking and I hear noise and De Niro comes running out. He goes, Marty, come back, come back, watch this. And I went in and Everett was, you know, he was going and the people were reacting and we stopped it. And I said, can you do that again sitting down? He goes, it's your world. <laughs> I said, sit down, man, two cameras on this bastard. And that was it, and he went off. So what you see in the film is when he's speaking about how we came out of Missouri and we rode our horses over our dead babies. Nobody's gonna take us from this land unless they kill us. And then ending with, you know, we never asked for the good life or the great life. We just asked for life. Right. I said, right. That's the movie, I said. That was the movie right, right there. And I don't know whether it was 
uh, narrative or whether it was what you would call a documentary, where we always talk about that unfair Mixed. separation. Yeah. Yeah. What happens there? That's real. Speaking of, thank you, Marty, it's powerful stuff. Um, thank you. The, Greta, can you talk about rehearsal sure. before? Um, and particularly, I'm interested in, in, in Robbie's body and the changes that go through Margaret Robbie's body. Oh, sure. And then can you talk about when you're on a set, I'll pick a specific scene, which I'd love, which would talk about the rehearsal of uh, the scene with Sa Sasha, first mm. meet, um, mm. because mm. it's a wonderful yeah. scene, and she obviously breaks down. So yeah. I'm curious how you rehearse that on set, but, but pre-shooting, pre what was the rehearsal process? Yeah, I, 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 love, I love rehearsal. I, um, I do a lot of it. I, I think um, thus far, I tend to either alone or I wrote the script with Noah Baumbach, who's my um, my husband and my um, and my uh, artistic partner, and on and we alone and also together. I tend to write very um, specific mus musical scripts and and i mean they they're not it's literally musicals although sometimes they are but they but they're i have a sense of how the rhythm of the words and it's not that i need them said in a certain way but there's a kind of a cadence and a meter that i actually sometimes even when i'm sitting under the camera sometimes i will just close my eyes and listen to people because i can hear whether or not it's correct and i think that um part of that is from my love of theater um and and in in film obviously editing often sets um sets the rhythm and in theater the language sets the rhythm and i think it's also i think my personal um love of you know, but it's kind of, um, you know, Preston Sturges or Ernst yeah. Lubitsch yeah. or, um, you know, uh, Howard Hawks, talkies. Uh, yeah. I love those. Fast the, talk. I love fast talk and, and that the actors are really setting the, the, the way you're experiencing the flow of the movie. Um, and so I think in that I do, I do what I, I kind of loosely term, which I took from theater table work, which is um, sitting around and sort of going slowly through and talking about the um, kind of the emotion and the detail of each, uh, every scene. And I'll tell you that there's no better way to vet how good your script is than to put it in the hands of good actors because they, they, can't, they can't fake it. Um, and, then, um, and then particularly with this one, you know, it's a, it's, there's a level of you have to be okay being ridiculous and take it quite seriously. And I think that that's part of what, the reason I was attracted to all of these actors. Um, I, I mean, Margot, I knew we were writing for, but we wrote for Ryan Gosling, even though I didn't know Ryan Gosling at all. And um, because I knew he was so funny, but I knew he's funny because he takes it incredibly seriously. And when we first spoke on the phone, he said, this this is a tragedy for this character. And I was like, "It's a yes, you're right, it's a tragedy. And he was playing it with that intensity. And I mean, I'll never forget when I was on set, and there's, you know, the scene with him and Margo and he's standing on that ridiculous Hummer and she's, and he's like, you know, Century City, um, you know, they've all got it all figured out in Century City. And she says, no, they don't have it figured out in Century City because we failed them. And he goes, no, you failed me. <laughs> and the way he did it, I was like, it's fucking on the waterfront, <laughs> but it's, it's Ken. What is this? Like it's, but it's like a level of just total commitment to something so strange. <laughs> and I, I think, I think for me, rehearsal was when I finally, you know, gathered everyone. I sort of, you know, do the table work individually in small groups, and then I gather, gather everyone. It's to get everybody comfortable with not being embarrassed about how much they have to go for it. And I think one thing that I also like that I've been able to do, and definitely in this one, there was so much dancing, and there we have obviously dancers like I was talking about, we, but also all the actors dance, and they don't necessarily feel the most comfortable dancing. I want to pick up just in terms yes. of, yeah. of the, yes. the actual 
sort of performance yes. level as you're talking about yeah. the comedy and being serious about it. Yeah. When in the table reads themselves, this is yes. before shooting, did you sometimes push them so that they would exaggerate or be hyperbolic on terms of something so that you could see where the range would be for their performance? Uh, I like to get, uh, in, in a way, I actually like to get everybody off of their feet as soon as we're, so I don't like everybody sitting around. I want them in their bodies because I like kind of the head to toe um, performance and also because I like seeing their whole bodies do it and I like being in the space with them while they do it. So I get them all on their feet and I don't push them to do it more or less. But I think what this sounds so odd, but the, there's a very long sequence in the beginning where they all say, Hi Barbie, hi Ken, hi Barbie, hi Ken, hi Barbie, hi Ken, hi Ken, hi Barbie, I got us both ice creams or whatever it is. Um, and I, I had them do it so many times because I wanted to them to embrace the absurdity of it. And I, something Ryan said after me, he said, I think you were tuning us like we were a choir. And it's less that I, I'm, I say go more extreme. It's more that like I get them all, it's like an, all their instruments are tuned so that then when I'm in a position of like, I, this sounds so it, almost like conducting them. I can say we're all we're all in the same orchestra. So if I go like this, you're not in a different orchestra. You then everybody knows. Okay, now they're okay. Now we're going over here, and that's what it felt like. And it really felt like a company in that way, and getting everybody together. But there were definitely I would drive home in the car, and I'd think, oh my god, what have I done to these? <laughs> you know, brilliant actors. And then, but, but it was, it was like either this is going to work or it's going to be ridiculous, but the only way out is through. Got it. <laughs> Question. Rehearsal on, <laughs> rehearsal on set itself. Yes. Let's look at that example using that scene where she first is with Sasha. And oh, yes, Sasha yes. What yes. Would, what's rehearsal? That's the day of what's going on. Uh, yeah. Well, we'd, we, uh, we'd obviously, we'd rehearsed it with Margot um, before we were actually on set. And that was one of the very few times we were like in the real world, real world. But the, me the meeting with Sasha, one of the reasons we cast Ariana, um, who's so, Ariana Greenblatt, who's so wonderful in it is, to be honest, in in the audition, she scared the shit out of us. She was like uh, maybe the opposite. She was tiny and she was looking at us with her intelligent eyes. And she was just and Margot's after she auditioned, Margot's like, I hope she thinks we're cool. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Margot, she definitely doesn't not. think we're cool at all. She, I was like, we're just two ladies who are not interesting to her at all. But we um, I mean, it was important for me that the character of Sasha be able to level all the criticisms intelligently against this uh, uh, this doll and that she do it in a way where you're like, she's right. Um, and I think part of that is because I, I grew up with a mother who didn't love Barbie. And I was like, if I, my mom is already like, oh my God, she's making Barbie movie. Um, and I was like, if I don't give these arguments real weight, she's, is, you know, I have to give them space. And I think it was about, um, for Sasha, I was like, I want to experience this, like land every punch, land every punch and don't ever let up. When, and I was like, I want you to think about it physically and I want you to wield your words and I think, I have a very satisfaction watching people who they, when they know what they're saying and they know that it's correct, it has an energy behind it that it's, it's like the words become physical. And so that's always how I kind of talked about that scene. And then Margot, who is just, you've worked with her. I mean, she's, um, I mean, we, last year it was, you all saw her and um, she's so marvelous in Babylon, but she really is that person. She really can cry out of one eye. She oh, really, amazing. she really she's can do. And you knew that. Yes, she's amazing. Yeah, she's, amazing. She she's, really she's, uh, she's, and she's to, she's like a, I, I don't know. She's, she's, she's incredible. And she, um, I think one of the things that she did that was so amazing that she was a producer on the film. So I was with her. You know, we were working for two years. Um, and then she kind of became an actor. She told me, uh, I, I'm about a month before we start shooting, I'm gonna put on my actor hat and, um, and then I'll immediately panic 
And um, she did. She put on her actor hat and then she came over to my house in the middle of the night and said, how the oh f- hell am I going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I thought you knew. <laughs> we, haven't we been? Um, but, then, but then she did know in a certain way, but it was a very odd thing. I mean, to play a character that has absolutely no internal life or desires, that's literally an object who then confronts the reality of death and then crumbles. I don't really know. That's like a kind of, it's a very strange assignment. If one, one, more, one more beat of this. Because at the end of that scene, she does yes. crumble. Yes, yeah, she crumbles, yeah. What did you, again, the day of rehearsing, what did, yeah. did you, did you, did you actually rehearse that whole piece or on the day of when you're now on this location rehearsing this moment? Yes, we'd rehearse that whole, I mean, we'd, I, I mean, like we'd gone, we'd gone ahead with our actors. I mean, the nice thing about it, we had all the, the builds and everything, but we also, um, uh, we, I was able to rehearse uh, the uh, before with the actors in that location, and it is a middle school. And actually, even when we were scouting it in the middle school, again, I just, you know, there's, I don't know that there's anything more terrifying than like 12, 13, and 14 year olds. Mm-hmm. They are yeah. uh, very, they're hard ones. Yeah. And I remember being that, and then I was looking around at them, and I was like, if I was in a pink cowboy suit, I would just want to die. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so in a way, it was, it was, we rehearsed it, but also, you know, Margot did feel like an incredible goober in in front of all of those like thirteen year olds wearing that outfit. And um and the same thing was true on Venice Beach when we shot on Venice Beach. So there's rehearsal, but then it was also this reality. And then the weird thing about Venice Beach was it was, you know, this kind of reality where everyone's like, you know, looking great to 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 Ryan and then to Margo. It's sort of like le- more leering and it's a different feeling. And it was actually happening in front of us. Uh, it was happening. Uh, the, the reality. It was. It was actually. People would recognize Ryan because you can't. Venice Beach is Venice Beach, and they'd be like, "Right on, man! You look awesome." And then they just look at Margot, and they'd look her up and down, and she was like, "It does have an undertone of violence," <laughs> and I was like, so it was "I know," <laughs> and so it was actually happening. But yeah, I love. I love rehearsals, and I. I think it's also like the time when once the once you're, once you're in it, and once the clock's going, I, I, I it is a timed art form in a way, mm-hmm. and I think it's um, very hard to get that sense of freedom with the clock. And I, and I, I try to preserve it no matter what. And I try to, if it feels like it's not going well, I do clear the set and just say, okay, let's figure this out. And even this is, if it's wrong, let's like change it somehow. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, you have that ability in rehearsal in a way that, um, you know, it, it goes away. Um, and I, but I like, I like rehearsal. Well, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> You've got an actor, Alexander, who's never acted before. What did you do? And we just saw right now an amazing performance by anybody. And that rehearsal. was, that was take one, by the way. Wow. Oh, wow. What's but, the but here's the deal. For me, uh, rehearsal really begins at auditions. I think, and especially if there's an actor, in the case of this kid, he had never been in front of a camera before. We, the casting director and her crew saw 800 submissions for that part. We didn't like any of them. And finally, we did, we pulled the trigger on a plan, which we were going to do at some, get around to doing at some point anyway, which is call up the schools where I actually was going to be shooting and see who was knocking around there. And there he was at Deerfield Academy, a senior at Deerfield, wanted to be an actor. He was a star, you know, ham bone in the drama department, was applying to Carnegie Mellon and NYU to be an actor, never even done a student film. And there he was. But he had no idea how to audition. And so bless his heart, you know, he made choices and (laughs) over-rehearsed and came in and did it badly. But the casting director and I saw something inside of him. So it was really like it was the reverse. It wasn't the actor like really advocating to get the part. It was our advocating to pull something we saw in him out of him. And that was one of his audition scenes that over maybe six or eight auditions and then finally with Paul Giamatti over Zoom. Uh, that was his audition scene. Oh wow. And so, but 
Do you remember? That, that's kind of, sorry, that's kind of an extreme example, but I just think, because I rely heavily on auditions. Uh, re- in this movie, the only one who didn't audition was Paul Giamatti. But uh, I mean, even in Nebraska 10 years ago, I pretty much knew I wanted to have Bruce Dern play the part, but I still asked him to come in and read just, just so I could get a sense of his words, his head saying those sounds. It just sort of helps me. Um, so it kind of starts there. And then practical audition, uh, it's usually about in the week before production starts, it's usually the back half of the day for about four hours, three o'clock, you know, because the first part of the day is there's a production meeting or last minute location scouting and the actors are getting their costume fittings or checking out their hotel or, you know, apartments or whatever. And then the back half of the day we get together and either as a group or in parts and, and rehearse but really just casually, just talking things through. As Greta says, you know, it's so once that meet, clock starts running, you're in trouble. So it's nice to have ironed out basic issues. I also like, if I can, to uh, take the actors to the locations. You know, if it's a couple's house where they've lived for 40 years and they're acting at, you know, the first day of shooting, that's not right. They should have visited that location before at least once to have some familiarity or ownership with it. I also like table reads, not necessarily because the writer and I or I get anything out of retooling the dialogue. It's really so all of the actors can get to know each other, particularly if I'm combining non-actors, you know, people off the street with movie stars so that they've met at least once before the day of shooting so the non-actor doesn't freak out. Oh, yeah, I go way back with George Clooney. Oh, yeah, you know. Um, and the other thing at those table reads, I like to invite the DP, key grip, gaffer, and the sound guys so that that collective feeling that we're all in this together begin then. You know, that they've all, and they get a, everybody gets, get a, especially the technicians get a sense of who those, and they like to feel included. When you're well. doing a scene and you're actually on set, let's look at the scene with the, where he's with his father. Um, which is a very you know, challenging scene, both for the actors playing the father as well as for Dominic. On the day of rehearsal, do you, what's your process before you're getting your camera out there to shoot it? Yeah, every scene's different. Sometimes I like to rehearse the hell out of it. One thing I've really, with experience, come to hate is, uh, what time did you get your first shot off? Who cares? <laughs> You know, as long as you get it. You know, in the old days, they'd rehearse oh, yeah. until lunch, you know, b- yeah. with the dolly and the focus puller and the actors yeah. and do two or three pages, have lunch, come back and do it. You know, so anyway, uh, each, scene, <laughs> each scene's a little bit different. And uh, sometimes, typically though, we know what we're doing, basically, or I'll get together and rehearse maybe on a Sunday, you know, before the work week especially if actors are just flying in, you know, anew and haven't really, they weren't maybe at the table reading or something. Uh, but I'll do a technical, it's a pretty standard filmmaking procedure, do a technical walkthrough. And then I kind of don't want to wreck what they've been thinking about all night and rehearsing. I sort of want to see them, what they bring, and then I'll do a take or two and then say, oh, what, what are you doing here? Well, that's great, now just faster, or well, can you, you know, just this, or whatever the hell it is. And in a way, each take is a rehearsal for the next take, is it not? And in a way, each day of shooting is a rehearsal for the entire rest of the schedule. You know, as the character, especially your leads, are falling into, falling into their characters and just, it's just ingrained in them. You remember um, the, the preparation of the scene where Divine says he's gone. It's, a, it's I guess it's at the party and she finally- I do indeed. Up. And how did that process, was there a rehearsal? No rehearsal, no rehearsal. I planted a wide shot. We did it technically. I didn't know what the hell she was planning. I didn't, nor did I wanna mess with it. And then it's two or three takes. The first one, two, three takes was actually uh, if I may speak, a little bit too big for my taste, for what, 
And then, then I kind of jumped in and said, all right, this is great, everything you're doing, but can you contain it a bit more? And then that's what's in the movie. Got it. It works incredibly well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. For the scene we just saw, we know he'd rehearsed it a number of times, and you just said his was his audition scene. How about here? Did you say anything? I mean, which, which, the scene we just saw on, right. on Dominic. No, I didn't say anything. Because he knew this as far he as He knew it. I just said, let's, let's, and I, I and I, I had, I had by that time in the schedule confidence that he could, I mean, the kid, you know, he'd never been in front of a camera before, a Tyro, whatever, but really talented. <laughs> it's really extraordinary. And then, you know, he had already been able to do three or four pages of dialogue with Giamatti and Wonners. You know, if you have a pianist who can play Liszt, give him Liszt to play. And so if you have actors who can do three or four pages of dialogue, take advantage and do a fluid master. And it's just such a gift. So I had no doubt that he could do that. And I wanted it as much as possible in, in a single take. You certainly got it. Yeah. Certainly got it. Yours. Um, Rehearsal for you, particularly, I know that you had different stages of her, Bella's development, so that I know that you must have, before you started shooting, at least talked or figured out both language and body. Talk about that beforehand, and I'll, I'd like to pick a specific scene, by the way. The one I'd like to, you to talk about is the scene, kill me or uh, marry me or kill me, <laughs> because there's timing in that scene that is pretty remarkable, uh, particularly the end of it. And I'm curious what happened in your rehearsal of that or whether it was as you know, Alexander is talking about, you know, just folk. But first rehearsal before you're shooting, what is that for you, yeah, particularly so, in this film? <clears throat> uh, my rehearsals are never um, trying to do anything like what we're going to do on the day. Uh, what I like to do is like get everybody together and do a lot of physical uh, stuff like exercises and play games and just to create this, you know, troupe in a way that they start feeling comfortable with each other and have fun with each other and... Give us one game. We don't all have to play it, but give us yeah. one game. Some of us may remember from last year, but give us one game. <laughs> one game. Um, so, for example, like, you know, we're rehearsing a space where there's, like, chairs and stuff. So, like, I, if it's, like, seven actors i go like okay we can have five chairs in the space and uh the six actors are just going to close their eyes and start walking around in the space uh and then there's one actor who's uh who has the task to to uh, so the actors that have their eyes closed at some point of their choosing they start slowly sitting down <laughs> and so the actor the, the, there's one actor left that has the task of putting a chair under their ass as they're sitting down otherwise they're gonna fall uh, so you know i just have them all walking around in space and like at different times like the actor who has the task to put the chairs under them like has to be really observant and you know, whoever starts sitting down, he has to grab a chair, go quickly, and sometimes it happens like three actors at, at the same time start sitting down, and <laughs> he has to rush around. And so that's like the first step of the process, and so they start getting warmed up, and then I go like, okay, let's read the scene now. And we read the scene, and it's like, okay, whatever you remember from the scene, they haven't learned their lines yet, so whatever you remember from the scene, as you're doing that, say your lines. So there's all these people doing all these other stuff that have nothing to do with the scene. They're trying to remember their lines. And there's this other actor who's trying to like not ever anybody fall on their ass. And it just creates, the, and it's funny and it, you know, and it's, they take turns in doing that. Like then someone else is responsible for that. So there's like loads of games, like I just improvise, like, you know, have these people there and, you know, think, oh, what could we play now? And, you know, and like, by the way, where are some of your, you're learning the, like this game, where are you getting these games from? I'm, I'm just, I'm you know, I just like com coming up with them. Like I, I had the opportunity to, um, I, I've done some theater and um, I had, you know, in theater in, in Greece, especially like we have a lot of time to, rehearse like we would rehearse for three months before you do a play so you don't even have to have an idea of how you're going to stage it you can actually work with the actors and figure it out so you you go through this process of learning the actors learning how you know what you can use in order to make them reach the point that you 
imagining or envisioning or but it's all about like giving them <clears throat> the space to be creative to feel good with each other to be ridiculous in front of each other and not care and the other important thing is like as i mentioned before like when you start um importing the the text in a way that is not um too intellectualized and too analyzed you know it, it they kind of acquire that knowledge of the language and the text in an unconscious way so you know on the day i mean i have no idea what they're going to do so Question I discover you about just just Bella's <laughs> development in terms Bella's of Bella's development. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, no. So, th but that was one uh, particular thing that we actually rehearsed for real because it was quite complicated, and you know, there's uh, some things we couldn't shoot in order. So she basically had to like jump, especially in the beginning. We shot, you know, because we shot London first, and it's the beginning of the film and the ending of the film. So she had to do that, those two things back to back and none of the middle. So she basically have, had to go from the least uh, developed to fully developed. And so we, we had some separate rehearsals with Emma, our, uh, the two of us, which were, we kind of figured out, we separated the script in stages, like uh, stages of her development. So it was like five stages. I think in the beginning we went for 10. But we decided that's too ambitious. Like we could no, never find like the, such minute details in order to assign them to ten different stages, and that would happen, you know, naturally when we're filming. So we separated the script in five stages, and then we would go like, okay, stage one, how do you move? How do you walk? How do you speak? How do you sound? And just actually rehearse that. In stage one, how it just uh, similar to what I was asking Greta, where were your extremes? Because you know this is the, the, probably the most challenging stage where she is a child. Yeah. Um, what was the extremes? Well, not an actual were... child, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were some of the extremes that, 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 or did you go to the extremes? Did you push it? Let's go this far, and then uh, let's pull it in back, or what was that process be, in discovering that, for example, that stage? It, it was more like you know trying th things out and like um <clears throat> instinctively feeling that okay this is feels good so we can go to the next stage now now would um, that be an agreement when you say this feels good because we've all been in the situation where the actor says this feels good but we don't no uh no i mean we're we're pretty much uh in sync with emma and uh which helps with many things. So yeah, it was a very straightforward process. Let's look at the, you know, that day of this particular shoot, shoot with where Mark Ruffalo is, is confronting her and, 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 and literally she comes this on the boat and she has that line, you want me to yeah. me or kill me. And then there's this wonderful silence between these two people. They're just looking at each other and I'm waiting for you to say, cut. And it, it, what happened? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I really remember that day. Like Mark was, <laughs> was very sick <laughs> and he was, uh, you know, he's really uh, doing everything in his power to be there. And, and it actually kind of helped in many ways. And, uh, we're trying to do this in one uh, one shot, uh, and we did like something like um, thirty takes of it, uh, and every time he'd do something different. But that that's just Mark in general, uh, and but also you know the added intensity of him trying to fight the sickness and you know and he had like tears in his eyes the whole time and he was using that in a certain way and um so yeah just uh, at one point he just took this huge pause and nobody know what nobody knew what he was going to do next if he was going to you know continue the scene if he was having a heart attack if he was going <laughs> to like we don't know and she didn't know and it's kind of apparent and and then he goes like, oh, I gotta go to the casino and he leaves. <laughs> so it was just, you know, one of the, and then we just did another couple of shots in order for me to, to be able to like figure out like all of these 
all of that stuff that he did, like yes. if I could somehow put it together. And it's it's only a couple of cuts, I think, towards the end of the scene. When but. you, when if, for example, like this, will you, because uh, will you come onto your set and will you work with your actors before you're setting up a shot or are you right into it? What's the process for you? No, it's more uh, just technically run it through so to see where they're going so I can uh, think about you know, the, the camera and the angles and what we need to do. Um, and not even that, because I, I, what I, I like to do is like, which is, you know, a nightmare for an AD, but I never say how many shots it's going to be. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, we go like, so they're coming from there and they're sitting there and I go like, oh, this, it'd be nice to do this move and this zoom. Uh, are you going to do another shot in this scene? I don't know. Let's see how it plays out and we'll figure it out. Uh, so then we do 30 takes of that, this particular scene. We don't, I don't generally do many takes, I think. Uh, but so we do 30 takes and, and go like, are we done? I go like, no, I think we need to do like a couple of more shots of them. You know, like, because I don't know, like, I like that last one, but the beginning was good from the first. Because you come from theater, um, when you want to give a redirection, what kind of language are you using? Grunts. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, you give us an example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You know>. <laughs> <laughs> no, but especially with Emma now, and we've made so many things, uh, it, it is true that we don't really have to say much. Like, you know, I'm near the camera, she so finishes a take, she kind of leans this way. She looks at me and goes like, okay, got it, got it. I'll do it again. And, you know, and she does. And, well, and some sometimes actors... it's like little things, like, you know, like Alexander says, like something needs to be faster, something needs to be, you know, slightly, you just try and, you know, like fine tune them. But they, you know, they're great actors. They, they know what they're doing. And um, I, I, I don't have the language to tell them specifically. I can just create a better environment. I can give them more time. I can give them more chances to do it. But I, you know, to have the language to actually tell them, I, I find it like very tricky and it might lead to very, uh, to a very wrong mm -hmm. direction. And that's the, the, uh, the reason uh, that I don't even like to discuss with them beforehand in general about the characters, about their motives, about their state of mind. Their I just don't want to know what they're thinking. I just want to be there as much as I can with as much distance I, that I can and observe what they're doing and try and be, you know, uh, clean to understand what's happening instead of us having agreed on, oh, this is why I'm doing this and this is why I'm doing it this way. And I'm going like, yeah, it's amazing. That's what's good. Do you feel that that also has been picking up what, what Alexander just said? Do you feel that also is now coming from having cast and knowing that these actors are already going to deliver because of the incredible talent you've got? Yeah, of course, that's part of it. But like even with people that I don't know or sometimes I work with non-professional actors, you just don't want to... You just don't want to be in the same lie. Like, yeah, we, we know what we're doing and this is what comes out and it actually doesn't. Other people don't see it that way. So I want to have the distance to be able to observe that and say, what are you doing? Like, this doesn't make any sense. And, you know, the, <laughs> and the actor might have something in their head like, yeah, but when she did that, yeah, but like, I, I, I don't, I never thought of all that and this just doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> and, and let's, after, let's try something different. You oh, know, that's what I wanted to know yeah. the next line. Let's try yeah, something let's try, No, don't do no. that. You know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Chris, do um, rehearsal beforehand, and obviously on the day of. What was yeah. the process here, and particularly working with Kim, who you've obviously known for years in terms of you know actually developing this as an actor? And here is a very different role. What was, if there was, a rehearsal time beforehand? How did you use it, and what was the process? Yeah, I mean, I've worked with Killian for twenty years, which helps. You know, we've got a good understanding, uh, mutual understanding. He he did a lot of preparation on his own. Um, and he would call me and talk to me about what he was doing and ask questions and things. Uh, as far as rehearsal specifically, 
what I like to do is just in my office, I'll get one or two of the actors. I'll do the different combinations of the principles and we'll just read a couple scenes. And I don't ask them to perform it. I just ask them to read it so I can hear the words in the room. And uh, if there's an extra character, I'll read the lines, which is horrible and embarrassing, but <laughs> humbling for me, which they enjoy. And <laughs> what I try to, we'll find things. I mean, with Killian in one scene, he was, there's a line he has where he's, it was originally scripted, um, isn't anyone gonna tell the truth about what's happening here? And he was very hung up on that and didn't wanna say it. And he's not the kind of actor to ever insist or whatever, but he found it expositional and, you know, and in talking it through and then not really rehearsing the scene full bore, but just, just going back and forth with, with it. We, I realized that he just needed to change it to, is anyone gonna tell the truth about what happened here? And then he was fine with it. And it's just those kind of like, little shifts, I'm rehearsing not to see what they're doing, to hear my script rattling around, and also to give them the vocabulary as we shoot for how to tell me to change things or when they need me to change things. So I'm sort of, in a way, not rehearsing the film, I'm rehearsing the process of working together. And we do that, you know, with the, with the principles for during prep as I have time. Um, and then what I do um, in, in shooting is, seven o'clock, cast on set, ready to shoot, and we rehearse, and just me and the cast. And then after one or two rehearsals, I'll let the DP come in and Hoyte will just stand to one side and just watch it. Um, and then at some point in that process, I'll see Nilo Otero, my first AD, will have like hidden himself in a closet somewhere and he'll be watching. And <laughs> So gradually we just bring everybody in and start to light around them as we rehearse and then I always try to shoot something very early, um, not for the traditional production report where the studio cares, but because if you don't, people stop believing that you will and everything gets slow or hair and makeup. No, nobody believes that you're serious about needing everybody ready at seven. Um, so try to shoot something early, even if it's a master that I might not use, but just to start rehearsal through running film through the camera. Because to me, until the film runs through the camera, nobody's really focused. So there can be beneficial discussions in rehearsal, but nothing's really, everything's loose and you need it to tighten up into that, that moment. And shooting does that. So that's, that's sort of the way I try to orient it. If you want to redirect, um, what kind of language might, and obviously this differs from actor to actor, um, but what kind of language will you use if you feel, oh, I want a, a something else here? Or what will be in the process? If it, I mean, you, you, for me, you skipped over the answer there because it's, I, I'm not sure it is obvious that it's different for every actor. It's completely different for every actor. So I honestly can't even answer that question because there are actors who want very careful just expressions or a word or two. There are actors that need you to abuse them horribly and, and you know, in some kind of humorous or quasi humorous manner and they, they like that and it releases tension. And there are other actors who demand, not literally demand, but you, you know that what they need is focus and calm and concentration. So there's a lot, there's a lot of different ways and sometimes it's about uh, not talking to the actors, but talking to the crew. Um, you know, and I have an understanding with, with my crew, sometimes I'll, I'll be hard on them because the actors need to see me do, they need to see me make sure that they're going to pay attention to the performances, that I'm caring about creating the right space for them, things like that. Um, but you feel that out with, with the actor and every actor is different. Um, the, the miraculous thing to me about actors is I've never met one who's the same as another, but when you put them in a two shot, when you put them in a master together, they find a common language that's, that's sort of beautiful. And that's the magic of the process that I'm not an actor and I don't understand it. And that's why I'm interested in it. Uh, and I learned years ago that even if you're not gonna use the sort of profile two shot or there isn't an easy shot, you have to film it because otherwise the close-ups won't match. You know, they'll be acting in two different movies um, and you need that wider coverage just to bring everybody into the same energy. In terms of, of, of performance, 
there, there are a number of scenes that come to mind that I feel probably were very challenging. Mm. One of them, and I'm interested in sort of the process, um, when he learns that Jean has died, this is outside, and Kitty has come to actually you know, wake up and you know, straighten up. Um, do you remember that process of, of, of that scene and how you were directing them or what happened? Yeah, it was some, um, it was outside, very cold, and we had to shoot it in, in Magic House. So it had to be done reasonably fast. We found a gully so the sun was off it early so we could st stretch that period a little bit. But it had to be done efficiently, and it was at the end of a very long day. Killian had already done the whole scene where he comes out of the rain to the back of a meeting of scientists who are sort of rebelling against the Manhattan Project. He'd done all of that, several other scenes, because he shot very fast. And so it was the end of a very long day, which I think actually helped his energy in a way. He was exhausted and, and very ready to shoot that scene, I think. Um, he and Emily Blunt have done another film together. They did A Quiet Place 2 together. So they had a lot, of, they're great friends, a lot of communication, and that really helped. The scene starts with horses, you know, and so everything, everything was difficult about it. But I think all of that kind of helped their performances. and. I, you know, I don't think I directed it very well at all, actually. I, I fumbled a lot on that day, but they they made it work really well. I knew what I wanted, but I was in that mindset because we were having to shoot very fast. So Emily, when she first goes down close to him, she moved so close to him that I knew I wouldn't be able to get a close up. So I immediately in rehearsal was like, well, maybe your character would sit a bit further back or whatever. And she more or less told me to fuck off, I mean, politely. <laughs> But she's like, don't box me and let me do my thing. And I was like, all right, fine. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and, you know, they, we got a beautiful profile two shot, some of which is in the film. And then when it came to the close up, we just figured it out. And you do, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, Hoyt is just like, yeah, we'll shove him over and cheat the whole thing or whatever and make it work. Um, and that generally is, is my mindset is to try and make it work and never interfere with what the actors are doing. But when you get that ticking clock and when you, you're really trying to get through things, you do interfere a bit too much. You try to control it too much. Um, but it didn't hurt the scene. And their, their ability to work together um, really made it, made it what it is. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a fun scene to shoot, actually. It was in, intense, in, but it was fun. In discussing the very last, which we saw here, mm. the very last scene for him in which all of this is now coming to a head, what has he created? Um, and in, in your story, he's constantly challenged, what do you really believe? And we know that that's part of our challenge as people who are in the midst of nuclear ages. Um, do you remember saying anything specific that for that last moment to him? Or do you remember that, you know, filming that itself? I mean, with Killian, I, he, he doesn't like to overly analyze things verbally. Um, and with this character who's so layered, there were various, there are various things that are put in the script to do with his intentionality or what his, he, to me, he was always a strategic thinker. So there are layers of strategy. So even when he's talking to Einstein at the end, you know, my take on it was is he's kind of fucking with Einstein a little bit, actually, as well as everything else that's going on. And I think some of those things Killian responded to and used and some of them he just rejected as being my sort of mechanistic version of what's going on as sort of overly overly clever overly overthinking things um and i've never really sat him down to ask him which you know i see it in the performance so i see what i think he's doing because he's but i think sometimes just having the conversation putting the thought in the actor's head even if they reject it they carry the ghost of it there's a there's a little layer there's a little overtone yeah. there for all of you, um, what do you do with stress? What's the most stressful part of directing for you? And uh, you know, what's the most stressful part of directing for you? And how do you deal with it, Chris? What's the most stressful part? Can't we start with Marty? I mean, <laughs> I, I can. I'm willing to. No, no, I'll do it. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm, maybe the stressful part. <laughs> most, most stressful, definitely uh, pre-production. I think pre-production starts off with this joyous wonderful we're going around the world we can shoot anywhere we can do anything 
which is so much fun. And then it gradually just gets hammered into a smaller and worse and more horrible box. And by the end, everybody is desperate to start shooting and to move on. And so years ago, I decided I would never prep for longer than 12 weeks. So we only ever prep 12 weeks. I do a soft prep with just myself and the designer for months beforehand. Um, and then we just do 12 weeks because to me, after that 12 weeks, you're just re-prepping it. You're losing locations, finding new ones. So you, you know, and I, I just can't take that stress for too long. So the way I, I manage it is to just limit that time period because I find that really the, the tricky part. Well, thank you. I think we're all going to take that lesson home. I like this one. <laughs> Yorgos, what would you say is the most stressful part for you as a director and how do you handle it? Uh, for me, it's it's filming because it's like I know every day that, you know, we'll probably won't have another chance to do this and it's like this forever. And that kind of, you know, takes a toll on you day after day. Uh, and how do you handle it? Well, medication. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say... What uh, we're looking for is authenticity up here, yeah. and so that's fine. You know, and uh, yeah, talking it out uh, with close collaborators, but yeah. Have you ever... Bills on, help, yeah. On this particular... Did, actually, on this because particular... Particular medication? Yeah, no, no, that, no that you matter. have to see a doctor. <laughs> tonight, <for that>. tonight. <laughs> but but, but uh, when, for example, you're in the position where I didn't get it all today, I want to mm. go back to this side. Uh, how do you handle that? Uh, I don't know. Like most of the times I swallow it and I, I rarely do reshoots uh, or because I, I don't know if, if it's like a thing that has like stayed with me from, you know, starting making films in Greece. It was inconceivable. I mean, we could barely shoot the actual stuff. <laughs> like to, to go back and reshoot something. Like we shot things like we we couldn't pay for anything. Like we we need to you know borrow uh, clothes from people because we can't you know buy clothes. Like there's there's nothing. So just the uh, and you know starting to make English language films and having some kind of a budget and all and structure which is helpful on one hand, but then it kind of limits you at the same time. It was inconceivable for me to go like, well, you know, we have to kind of, you know, have another extra day or like this. I don't know. There's this kind of sense of responsibility and, and failure that you didn't manage that I, you know, I, I try to figure it out without having to uh, go back. Sometimes we can just go back like when when you know you're shooting at the same location or near or whatever you might have another chance now I've learned after some films that it's it's okay if you if you have to go back yeah. um, So I, I'll try to do it that Got it. for example. Got it. Thank you. Thank you Alexander what do you do with stress? Or what's the most stressful part of directing for you? And I don't what, know how do you it handle it? Kubrick or Spielberg who said the most stressful part is getting out of the car every That's morning. It. Kubrick. Uh, yeah. Kubrick. Getting yeah, out of the car. Yeah. Getting and out of the car. What Just kind of that, car do you that, that terror yep. of of being picked up and being driven and looking at your pages and how's it gonna be? And then oh. going through that phalanx oh. of trucks and bearded oh. men with walkie talkies. Oh. <laughs> Wolfing oh. down breakfast in their muscular calves out, yeah. even when it's yeah. when it's oh. thir you know twenty below zero, and and you know I, that fear that the 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 huge mechanics of it are going to somehow mar the intimacy exactly. of what you want to shoot that day. So there's that. I relate to what Chris said about the last couple of weeks of prep. I, I can see that. Uh, and then every day, I mean, this is you know everyday bread. Every day there's something that's trying to freak you out. Like, it's going to rain this afternoon, or the actor's l chipped his tooth, or the actor says, well, wait a second, I had the keys in my right hand and the master, and we just did the, I had the keys in my left hand. And, you know, like, it's just a constant process of people trying to freak you the fuck out every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's the little things. And then kind of as, as Yorgos was saying, then just the fatigue 
that sets in in the back half of particularly long schedule and, and fighting that. So, uh, so how do you deal with these stressful moments? It's like a bad drug trip. It's just the only way out of it is through it. Yeah. Yeah. Just like Greta was saying, only way out of it is you just keep going. Yeah. Plus, we're just so lucky to be doing it. And also with experience, you go, all right, I've been through this before and it'll be okay and whatever. It's, it's just a movie. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. Greta, what of directing is uh, stressful for you and how do you uh, deal with it? Um, I, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. I think it's stressful from sort of beginning to end uh, the whole time, particularly when people look at you and say, well, why would we give you money to make this? <laughs> you think, oh, well, you don't have to. Hey. Um, uh, I, I think the times I'm most, um, I get most worried is actually when um, an actor is having trouble uh, or and that I can't figure out how to help them or I feel like, uh, it's um it's exactly what Chris was saying. Every actor is different, and everybody needs something different to to do their work. And it's a, a you know, as much as you know, as incredible production design and have the DP and everything, but the audience feels through the actor, and it's and it's very um, you know, it's just a, a panicked moment when um, you feel you need to help them and you can't figure out how and they can't figure out what they need and usually I think it is the answer is slowing everything down clearing people out and trying to figure it out which can be very hard to do and then I and then I find um weekends are really hard because um when you're on set and in the 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 the, the, the pace of it, it, it has its own rhythm. And then when you're taken out of it for two days, it's actually hard. I find it hard because that's when I start questioning everything. And I start, um, then I, I, every night I fall asleep, I cut it in my head. And then I find, I'm like, oh, I didn't get that shot. Okay, well then I cut, I, it, it's like the kind of the insecurity wheels get really um, moving on the weekends. Uh, and how do you deal with it? Eat, panic, <laughs> just stress, st stressed out. I hold my dog and I eat. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, I call, I, yeah, the last couple of weeks of prep are terrible. Um, and Noah always reminds me, he said, just remember, you shoot it one day at a time. You don't yeah. have to shoot That's the right. whole movie on Monday. Right. You shoot the scenes you have to shoot right. on Monday. And I'm That's like, right. right, I only have to shoot one day at a time. I mean, I think this is a post thing, but um, testing the first test is just, it's like telling someone you love them and getting a grade. And you're like, I told you I loved you. I got a 71. What the fuck? And then you're like, and then you read these comments that are like, just, just, you just cry. And then, and then you have to go back in. Um, but, but then, but then it's, you know, the, I think part of what's addicting about making films is the feeling of being kind of on a precipice at all moments. And, um, I think I don't, I, 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 I love this sort of high wireness of it and I like the kind of collapse that's possible, um, which is probably a psychological issue I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to go sell some <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And well, also, and the adrenaline. The adrenaline, Because I mean, you're all yeah. hyped up on adrenaline. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's, um, yeah, it's the greatest thrill. I always say um, the greatest thrill of my life has been able to, the fact that I get to direct movies. It's the greatest thrill uh, being with uh, so many different kinds of artists, being able to realize it. It's, it's a communal art form that happens between people. And I think, I mean, for me, I, be, I mean, it's not, I, this is being a mom and being a director, the two, best things I've ever gotten to do and being able to do them at the same time is kind of brings me to tears. Right on. <laughs>
as you, as you say in your movie, you can hold logic and feeling at the same time. <laughs> yes, that's Marty, right. Mm. I know you never yes. feel stress. I know oh, it's no. not <laughs> a thing for you. Nothing bothers me. I know. But if it did, <laughs> what if you were if you were to say what the most stressful part? I mean, of directing everything that they've said. <laughs> everything that they've said, except that uh, I really do think it's the, it's the shooting that gets me. And don't forget, we come from back in 71 and 72, where if something was scheduled for one day, somebody comes on the set and says, you gotta do it in half a day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what happened? So, I mean, now, <laughs> I mean, the great thing though is, you know, 81, I mean, the reality is like, it's been such extraordinary gift. I can't complain about it. I enjoy the complaining as part of the process. <laughs> <laughs> it's important, I'm not getting yeah, it. Because cool. like in the morning when, you, when Kubrick said, getting out of the car, Okay, hit me with it. Bang, you close the door. I see who's in front of that trailer. I, you know, the first days we never had trailers. So, you know, we hardly had film. I'm only joking. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, get in the trailer and then I'm in there and I said, I'm just alone. And all of a sudden they knock on the door and they come in. <laughs> and they come in, it's, the, it's my DP and the two ADs and maybe another assistant. And then I become Basil Faulty. <laughs> I go into rants and it's usually about the car or it's about the cup or it's about what the television is right here and they can't get TCM today in this place. I can't believe it. And we're back and forth and back and forth and then you know, we have one issue and what is that? And I'm ranting and ranting and ranting and ranting and ranting. Sometimes it goes on for like 15, 20 minutes and then, and they're all standing there and then we start to laugh and the laughter is what it's about. With laughter, it's what it's about. And it all comes out and then I come out and really then we get into now all the anxiety of the day, the weather, the, uh, the, the uh, and working with actors and non-actors, animals in the frame, all this sort of thing. And again, you know, I also in the past, been very blessed again in the past uh, 10 years to have working on pictures, maybe except in, in Taiwan and, and silence where the, where the, nature of uh, the terrain was such that uh, we were forced to shoot a certain way. You know, it was hardly any CGI, they were just working. Um, uh, but I, uh, prior to that, I have had situations where not only did I get out of the trailer and there were certain people that were against the film and then you had to fight your way through them all day and into the evening, special meetings and threats and that sort of thing. And you're just, you're just a pugilist. You fight and fight and fight. And um, I even find that sometimes if you, it's almost, I got to the point where if they, if they tell me, don't worry, you have another day to, I start to worry anyway. Mm. What are they gonna do? Mm. That can't be I have another day, you know? So uh, give me the problem, you know? <laughs> tell me I don't have the other day so I could fight against it and get the other day, you know? <laughs> and then after a while they say, no, you don't have to do this. All right, so there's certain things were happening. But the biggest issue ultimately is the stamina. Um, and as I was saying, legs and um, staying as clear headed as possible. And even, find, even finding certain, you know, long setups if I can take a nap if possible. Um, <laughs> you know, but I do find that um, the shooting is the hardest. I want to get to that editing room. I edit as much in my head as possible. That's why we're talking about dialogue scenes. Even if it's a shot, a shot of two people, to, I know that that's gonna go there. I know that's gonna, we can use that from that take. I, um, otherwise, and I could do it. I know I have it. Uh, but the editing room is really, uh, myself and my, my, my friend, my editor, Thelma, we really enjoy just being left alone <laughs> to make the picture until we screen it for everybody and then they get mad at us again. <laughs> You know what I mean? They said, what do you do? You know? So, uh, but that is a pre-production, don't mind too much, but there is that thing in pre-production where they start giving you calendars now and you look and it says, you're 20 days away from shooting. I said, Ugh. I know. 19 <laughs> days away, six days. Yeah. All right, <laughs> all right, let's, you know what? Let's start shooting. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, oh my God, it's all coming. Yes, it's coming down. That's what it is. That's how we do it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Yeah. All five of you, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's terrifying. Bullshit. All five of you do this <laughs> incredibly well. And we want to thank you for being who you are, Thanks, for being such great filmmakers, <laughs> for making such wonderful films. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And I'm going to stand up for you because you deserve it. <laughs> Five days away. Oh.